someone who was always ready to communicate, someone who had not an ounce of any kind of snobbery or self-importance, but who could really connect with all of us. It was at a time when people like to say that women were inferior to men intellectually, because where were the female Leonardo's and the female Einstein's, you know? My interest in the Library of Alexandria predates um, even my friendship with Carl. And I wrote about it in my first novel. And so um, in reading Gibbon, his history of the Roman Empire, I found this paragraph about the intellectual light of the Library of Alexandria in its last years, uh, the mathematician philosopher Hypatia, and I got very excited. The more I read about her work on the Diophantine equations and the fact that she was punished for her leadership at the library uh, by being carved to bits with abalone shells, it kind of answered the question for me, you know, well, why are there more women doing this? Well, most women never get a chance to do it. And that was especially true in the 1970s. But, um, you know, when they stick their necks out and actually move to a, a position of leadership, they're punished. And um, Carl gave me this abalone shell. He had it specially encased in Lucite. And we decided we wanted to write a science fiction story that would be about a woman who goes on a great adventure. Leave the boys home. Leave the men home. Let her be Odysseus. Let her be uh, the adventurer and uh, the intrepid discoverer instead of anyone else. And that was the inspiration for Contact. We wanted to create a female hero for everyone. I had this dream of taking Carl's two camera pieces, which were filmed. So the information in every frame is as good as it gets. And they are, they jump off the screen. But I've had this dream of, of completely doing the visual effects now and updating, for instance, the cosmic calendar. We could now put Carl, the original Carl, in the cosmic calendar uh, very persuasively, but we could change some of the dates because one, one of the few things about cosmos that has changed is the scientific consensus on the age of the universe since 1979 when we were shooting it. You know, I would that's what I would love to do is like redo the visual effects so that your the ship of the imagination is traveling through the universe that we've come to know since. And um I just think even if we just did episode one for the calendar for the trip across the visible universe and the Library of Alexandria. I think it would be dazzling. And I think what Carl was saying, what we all wrote together, holds up so brilliantly, if I may say so. I'm largely a testament to Carl and Steve's uh, uh, understanding of the, of, of the science and the responsibility that they felt in speculating. They had very good aim. And their speculations were astonishingly prophetic. Anyway, what I would love to do was to reproduce episode one, wouldn't be that expensive, and make it available to everyone on earth because episode one really is the story of how we found our coordinates in space and time. That's the whole subject of the series, but it is the newfound coordinates. and the value that's at the heart of science, which is it matters what's true. It matters what's true. That's what Carl taught me. And if instead of being driven by our fears, we were driven 
by the little we know about nature to act, then I know we would get out of the mess we're in. I know we would. You know, when I think of the voyagers that are still functioning, still functioning, launched before the first cosmos in 1977 and still exceeding the craziest expectations of the engineers who designed them and the scientists who built their trajectories. And they were launched 20 years after Sputnik. So we go from putting our first little metal ball into space. All it does is a radio in a ball in space. Put that into orbit. It's the first thing that humans have ever been able to make, leave the Earth and travel in near Earth orbit. And it's 20 years from there to two interstellar spacecraft that gave us our first visions of the outer solar system, our first, our deepest understanding about the planets and moons of the outer solar system, and now carry this these messages that were so lovingly created. The most distant objects ever touched by human hands. We have a great learning curve. We can do this. And uh, that's the essence of what I feel, not despair. I feel a sense of great belief in human beings and what we can accomplish if we could just awaken to what the scientists are telling us. You know, there's not a single person, human, who can hear my voice at this moment who is not descended from countless generations of people and primates who had their backs to the wall, whether it was climate, disease, drought, we are only here talking to each other right this moment because we're descended from people who survived much worse. I take a lot of hope from that, but that's not to say that I don't feel a sense of grief about where we are. You mentioned Steve Soder, so I did also wow. talk with him. He also mentioned uh, staying up all night with you one time, uh, working on the Kepler episode that they had already filmed. <laughs> if you also yeah. want to comment on that. <laughs> yes, well, you know what people don't uh, realize is that every single word, except for one in Carl's case, in the first season of Cosmos, and every single word in the second and third seasons of Cosmos were written. It was totally scripted. And um, and so uh, on this particular uh, all-nighter that Steve was talking about, and I think there were more than one, Steve and I were writing voiceover for episode three of the first season of Cosmos, which is about uh, the great Johannes Kepler. And, you know, writing voiceover for a sequence that's already been shot and edited can be very challenging <laughs> because... Um, you know, there we were faced with a long uh, close-up of a golden pretzel <laughs> that was the uh, the sign outside of Baker's in, you know, Gratz, where uh, Kepler lived. We were writing about Kepler's laws and his struggles with Tycho Brahe. And I mean, he's doing something which essentially is completely new. And we're looking at this golden pretzel. <laughs> but it was at that moment that there was an earthquake. Mm -hmm. And we were in the bowels of uh, KCET, which was the public uh, television outlet in Los Angeles, where we produce Cosmos. And we're looking at the pretzel and Steve says, earthquake. And I go, earthquake? This has got nothing to do with an earthquake. We can't start talking about an earthquake. And he knows, he goes, no, 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 earthquake. And I'm like, Steve, what's wrong with you? It's like two or three in the morning. 
And he grabbed me by the wrist and he said, we're having an earthquake. <laughs> and we ran outside into the night at KCET and uh, just stood there. And he was right, of course. For those of you who, who love Cosmos, uh, please know what an important role Steve Soder played in, in, in making it as good as I think it is. During that, you said all of it was scripted on Carl's part, except for one? Actually, three words. Um, so we were uh, at Cambridge University. And remember, this is before Google. And Steve and I had taken a uh, adding machine tape, paper tape, and we were putting zeros on it for hours in order for Carl to walk the beautiful campus of Cambridge University trailing this endless, seemingly endless uh, tape with these big magic marker zeros running the length of it. And next time we see Carl, he's at the high table at Cambridge. And he says famously, if you want to make an apple pie, you have to start a whole universe. And a Cambridge University high table waiter emerges from the kitchen with an apple pie. He places the apple pie before Carl, uh, who's sitting at the table. And Carl attempts to cut the apple pie and serve himself a piece. And he looks up at the camera and he says, crumbly, but good. <laughs> and that was just the, that was an ad lib. It really worked. We kept it in there. But that was the only ad lib in the whole series. As soon, as soon as you said Cambridge, I I I was like, it's gonna be the crumbly but good line, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I was <laughs> yeah, so that, calm. That that's Perfect. one of my favorites. One of my favorites, a favorite less intellectual quotes from him. I won't say <laughs> I put it above pale blue dot or anything, but yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. I agree because you know there you see Carl the human, you know the totally real, unpretentious, wonderful guy. Yeah. And then speaking of desserts, I, I have a segue for this too. Oh, um, <laughs> when I was talking to Joe Burns, um, I was talking to Joe Burns and Joe Viverka, um, and Joe Burns mentioned that he would often see Carl at the Statler Hotel restaurant eating a Black Forest cake. He said that Absolutely. was his favorite. Right. <laughs> Carl loved chocolate as... I mean, I would, you know, during our wonderful years together, I was always, I always had some Hershey's Kisses in my pocket, you know, at all times or a Hershey bar because he loved chocolate. He appreciated chocolate, even ordinary, you know, just a Hershey bar. And it just made him smile. He, his whole face was suffused with joy. And uh, of course he was ordering the Black Forest cake. I remember I was with him on some of those wonderful lunches together. He loved chocolate. He really did. You know, wherever you are around the world, next time you get a chance, take a bite of chocolate and just remember how much pleasure Carl Sagan took in doing exactly what you're doing. At the same dinner uh, with, with, with the two Joes, Professor Phil Nicholson was also there. Oh, yeah. Um, and he mentioned that Carl would often have a dictaphone that he would talk into. He he had two little dictation machines. They were just tape recorders and they were very portable. And he always carried two with him at the same time. One was uh, for scientific papers, scientific work. And the other one was for uh, articles, chapters of books, articles for Parade Magazine, um, family correspondence, and, and so he would generate very often two complete 45 minute tapes, both sides every day. And he was very lucky to work with a number of people in his Cornell office who were expert transcribers. And the next morning, a file folder, you know, sort of brown file folders with the elastic, you know, and you you take the elastic off and you un you take the cover off and inside there would be approximately four or five pounds 
of transcribed material of paper, which had all been typed by one or two or three people. It depended at different times. And he would generate that work. He never worked at a keyboard, ever. Sometimes he would write by hand on a vanilla, on a, a legal pad, but mostly he was dictating into these little recording machines. And what's so amazing is that if you look at the transcriptions at the Library of Congress, for instance, you'll see how he was able to speak in what I call lapidary prose, perfect paragraphs that could be carved in marble directly from his uh, dictation. And it was always astonishing to me. I, and of course, when he gave public talks, he, he never was reading. He never had a script. He would have one little uh, card. And on that card would maybe be four words, four keywords. And that was it. And it was all extemporaneous. And, you know, as we look at these today online, is to realize what a great mind. Uh, I, I just, I remain in awe of him as well as I knew him. I think the greatest joy for me is that I'm the recipient every single day of emails from everywhere on earth. And they express this love for him. And I think to myself, how lucky I am that I know and my kids know that he was even better in person as a human being. He was completely true to the values that he spoke of. In every aspect of his life, he didn't have one law for science and another for life, one law for the public and another inside. He was exactly who he appeared to be. And I think that's one of the reasons that his appeal is so enduring. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I, there's so many things you say. I just, I'm sitting there like, wow, <laughs> afterwards, and I don't have anything to say, but. Yeah. That's how I feel. I feel like, wow. That's how I feel about my whole life and my astonishing good fortune. I mean, it's to me, it's still a dream that we found each other. It's still a dream and that we spent so much time with each other and that we treated each other so well. It's, it's a dream, you know, to spend 20 years truly in love with someone and then you know, it's now almost 30 years that Carl is gone, and yet his, his presence in his absence is so much more vivid and nourishing than many people who actually are still here. I think it's, I think he's more beloved than ever. I want to just take a moment to salute Lisa Kaltenegger because it was her vision that created, she created the Carl Sagan Institute at Cornell. And not only did she create it, but when I look at the faculty and the students there, I see exactly what Carl would have wanted. I see exactly the same uh, vision of what the community of science could become and what it was not at all when he was starting out and what he wanted to see. And um, so I really want to thank Lisa and express uh, my admiration for her, not only as a scientist and as a writer, having written a wonderful book, but also uh, as, a, as a woman, as a human, um, and a great force for good. So I want to thank her and Gillis. I want to thank you. Um, you have, you know, now it's a couple of years now that we have been collaborating on some of these events, and uh, you have brought so much to all of it. And uh, it's just a joy to talk with you and to work with you. And um, thanks for your devotion to the things I think are really important. Thank you. It it means a lot to to hear that from you. It it's it's very special. So thank you so much. I mean it.